speaker up here. Our first speaker, Chester Moore, he's an award-winning journalist and author, so check out some of his books. He was named a hero of conservation by Field and Stream Magazine. And, yes, and he's also, this guy loves to chime in over here. <laughs> he's founder of the Kingdom Zoo in Orange, Texas. By the way, cryptozoologists come in two species, hats and no hats, and this guy's a hybrid. <laughs> Chester Moore. Hey, thank you guys. It was one of those nights where it was getting really late. The eyelids were just forcing themselves closed early in my Bigfoot research. And we decided it's four o'clock. We have two hours to get home. Let's go home. Nothing has happened. And as we put everything from the chairs and the food and the gun. Yes, I'm from Texas. I carry a gun. I'm going to leave I got a story about that later. <laughs> Into the vehicle, all hell broke loose. I heard a vocalization that I don't care what skeptic heard this. Had they been there that night, they would have questioned every belief rigid system that they ever had about what could be in the woods. This wasn't a whoop, it wasn't a scream. It could only be described as guttural, visceral, and mad. I had just been to Venezuela six months earlier and got myself in a little bit of trouble from harassing a howler monkey, okay? I love wildlife. I'm a wildlife journalist, been doing it for 25 years. This week marks 25 years my first article got published. And I was a puppy then, I was 19. And I thought something just clicked in me. I'm like, oh my God, it sounds like a howler monkey. A lot like a howler monkey, but like on roids. Like, you know, like old school like Mr. Olympia competition steroids back in the day, right? And I'm going, so I did what I did to the howler monkey. I growled at it. I went, and it did one growl, 10 times louder than me. And then I did two, and it growled twice. And then I did it three times. And it growled really loud, went into a, a high pitch yell very similar to the sound you hear on the ledge of Boggy Creek. And then it left. It sounded like a bison running through the brush. It's so big, it was breaking branches on the way out. And what was interesting to me was this. That's the same behavior the howler monkey exhibited. Because after I mocked it once, it, mocked, it, it, mocked, it sounded back to me. Twice it sounded back to me. On the third time, it got mad, let out a high-pitched scream, broke branches, and left. And so something clicked in me that night, and the journalist in me, the young journalist in me at the time, that primate behavior just happened here. And so that began a lot of hardcore Bigfoot field research. Um, and it's been an interesting journey. My talk today is about wildlife, wildlife journalist perspective of the Bigfoot phenomenon. Because it's a different perspective. I am a wild, I'm the outdoors business. I do this to make a living. I write about wildlife. Let me tell you, it's not easy to do this when you admit that you're into the Bigfoot search, okay? I had to come into this and do it very intelligently to survive in my career. And I've survived and prospered, it's been fine. Um, and the fact, you know, my source is the Lord. I'm not really worried about public opinion. But at the same time, i got to be wise about how you do things. So I, I said, if I'm going to pursue this, I'm going to do like everything I do, give it my all, but i got to pursue it like a journalist pursues it. And number one, you know, we know the old adage, uh, dog bites man, no one cares. Man bites dog, there's a story. Yeah. Well, the biggest man bites dog story in the history of wildlife is the Bigfoot phenomenon. People going into the woods, one of two things is happening. It's the biggest mass delusion and fakery in the history of wildlife, or something's out there. And if I'm someone who's a journalist writing about wildlife, I need to go pursue this. And that night, something just clicked. It clicked to the extent I spent two grand on Generation 3 night goggles the next morning. I'm like, I'm in, this is cool. Because besides being a journalist, I grew up watching The Legend of Boggy Creek. 
I have, I still have my dad's copy of the Argosy magazine with the Patterson Gimlin images in it. I'm a child of the late 70s, early 80s, where it was omnipresent to watch In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy and, you know, to see all the mystery monsters and all these different programs that kind of were stuck in our brains somewhere. And I would go to the library and, you know, I would pick up books on leopards and elephants and snakes, but if they had a Bigfoot book, you bet I'd get that one, maybe a Loch Ness one too. So I'm going to kind of give you a few things and kind of from the perspective of things I've encountered that have been really interesting. And also how the general public, the questions I get from people who aren't squatchers, people who just have an interest in it, people who wouldn't come to a conference, but they may be very interested, and sometimes they have an interesting story to tell. And the number one question I get, of course, is, why don't people see them? I get this all the time. Why don't people see Bigfoots if they're real? I'm like, well, this is a really weird question. Because you're admitting that people report them, somebody must be seeing or making up a story. And I tell them that there are all kinds of reports out there. And I go into all that, but people, here's, here's the thing though I found out. About half of them think if there is one, there's one. I'm not lying. I, I encounter this all the time. Well, there was a Bigfoot, well, how could it be in Washington and then be in Texas? I'm like, if there was one, that would be a great question. I'd like to know his mode of travel, right? Is he flying southwest on the frontiers? How's he getting there, right? Does he get a special discount, you know? Um, but the fact is, there are species. I said, if they're real, there are species. There's, there's moms, dads, little ones in between, grandmas, grandpas. There's a bunch of them out there if they're real. So people really have that perception. A lot of people be surprised. How many people think, I mean, I had somebody recently tell me Bigfoot must be getting old by now. <laughs> and, and I'm like, really? <laughs> Look, if you want to come up and say, oh, that Bigfoot stuff's crazy, science has never proven it, that's fine. That's, well, that's, there's some logic there. There's, you know, there, there's, I can understand that. However, if you say, well, it might be real, but there was only one, and he's been traveling the country, I mean, I, I have a hard time with that, but that's one of the perceptions is. Because what we are talking about here is the fantastic. It is the supernatural. It is something that changes people's lives when they encounter it. And that has its own interesting uh, side notes and, and things there. But the other thing I get, of course, is where is the body? And this has been debated, and people have talked about this. I've written about it. Everyone's talked about the body issue. But I have found when you address people just with basically scientific observation, I tell them, okay, let's just say they're real, and you're wondering where the body is. We would admit they're not a reptile. They're not a bird. Not an amphibian. If they're alive in the images we see in reports, there's some kind of primate. Primates are long-lived animals. Chimpanzees live like 60, 70 years. Okay? We don't know how old these things could be. Humans live to be up to 100 years old. So, if you have an animal, and we've got to admit, they're not common. You know, you don't like to go to the supermarket and see like, you know, you see, you see a raccoon sometimes behind the dumpster. You don't simply see a lot of Sasquatches. If you do, tell me I'm going to put a game camera back there, right? <laughs> but, so if you have an animal that's long-lived, and you have an animal that has a low population base, and then you have the chances of finding a body are really small. And then you got to figure out where they live, in the woods. When I filmed uh, the Texas Bigfoot um, episode of Animal X back in 05, uh, we stuck a deer carcass we found on the side of the road out in the woods. It took 24 hours for that carcass to be a part of a rib cage. It was like a piece of a rib cage about the size of a slice of pizza because the vultures found it. Right? They just wiped it out. Okay? So, if you have an animal that has a low population base, a long lifespan, you're not going to have a lot of bodies. It lives in the woods and then you have the factor of all the stuff that eats it. Deer shed their antlers every year. Not just whitetail, but mule deer, moose. Have you seen moose antlers? They disappear. Why? Because the rodents eat them. It's the good Lord's calcium supply for the woods. That's how it works. 
So nature works. And the other thing that no one ever considers is this. We're the only weirdos on the planet going to go out and poke a stick at a dead, nasty carcass in the woods. Right? Most people see something dead, they don't go, it's a Sasquatch. You know, they see like some kind of bone, it's got to be a Sasquatch. If someone, what are the chances that someone has seen some part of a decomposing carcass in the woods or whatever, they're going to go, we got to bring that home with us. So the chances of that happening aren't very. Good. So that, that, that's something that when, when I communicate these things, people tend to be like, okay, well, that's, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Now, you, it, it kind of drives me nuts that the Patterson-Gimlin film is still the epicenter of Sasquatchology, so to speak. I think we've so far passed that in evidence. But of course it is. You can't deny the film. Whatever side you come on the film, you can't deny the film. Now, I've looked at the film and, and figured out, well... If that was a fake, how come no one's fake one better with modern technology since then? To me, that, that right there alone, there's nothing that looks anywhere remotely as good as the patterson Gimlin film. But I want to share as, this is, this is something that just blew my mind that I got to kind of have behind the scenes deal. So Bob Gimlin hasn't been doing conventions and stuff for a long, long, he hasn't been his whole life set up at a Bigfoot convention, right? In 03, he did one in Willow Creek, and I was there. We had the room right next to him. And me and my dad and him hung out with him the whole weekend. And I had my Southern Crypto Conference going at the time. And I asked him if he would come speak. And he obliged. We paid him to come speak. And we brought him in. We had a hotel room. Well, Bob wanted to come in a couple days early and hang out and just see some stuff in Texas. So we got to hang out with Bob, which was an amazing experience. I took Bob to one of my Bigfoot sites in the Big Thicket National Preserve. I'm like, oh, that'll be so cool to get footage now, you know? Like the, the Gimlin Moore footage, you know, something like that. <laughs> Didn't work out. Didn't work out. Let's guess that's fine. Obviously, I'm not a faker because that would have been the prime opportunity, right? <laughs> but I had something that people often question Bob Crop's credibility because of the 95 different guys that say they've been in the suit. You know, there's always some guy every 10 years been in the suit. I sat in the hotel room with my wife and a speaker at my conference at the time. And he had a bunch of the really high resolution images and blow ups and enhancements of the film. Bob had never seen these. He had basically at that time seen a couple of blow ups and then he saw, you know, what you see on TV and what he saw in person. Bob's watching this and all of a sudden Bob starts weeping. I never talked about this. But on the 50th anniversary, it's a good enough time to mention this. Bob starts crying. I'm like, Bob, what's wrong, man? You okay? He goes, Chester, if Roger Patterson would have seen this before he died, he would have died in peace. He would have felt validated. So for someone to come and say they've been faking this, and for me to have seen that happen in a private setting like that, it's just, just no way. That's a Sasquatch walking across Bluff Creek in 19, October 20th, 1967, right? So that's just one of the amazing little things that I've gotten to see over the years. I had a great time with Bob, and Bob, like 80-something, could still like kick all of our behinds, right? <laughs> like Bob is like the man, right? And um, an incredible guy. And the truth is, I bet there was much of his life he wished he wouldn't have been there. You know? Because no one had an idea it was going to turn into what it turned into, right? Ridicule. All those kind of things. And last night I posted a blog at what, the wildlifejournalist.com. And in the blog I talk about there's an animal underground. There really is. Um, if you think about it, you know, we had the Underground Railroad in the 1800s where slaves would sneak on certain trails and paths and, and safe houses to get into the north where slavery was abolished, right? It was a great thing. Yeah. There's, there's, there's kind of by default an animal underground in America. Animals don't know it, although they kind of flourish because of it. And, the, and, and it's this. Number one thing is there is a narrative about wildlife in America. Academia, right? Uh, this, uh, the scientific community, the media, all part of this. And my first real brush with it came with the ivory billed woodpecker. Uh, I was writing about the ivory billed woodpecker for a number of years, how there were lots of consistent reports 
And in 2002, Zeiss Sports Optics sponsored a, a month-long search in the Pearl River Wildlife Management Area. And this was such a cool thing. Only like CNN and stuff was getting in with them. And I managed to go in with them. All right, and I went in with a guy named Martian Lambertine from the Netherlands and David Luno here from America and spent the day in the field with all their devices and they were showing me some things they were finding and it was really fascinating. Fast forward to 2004, David Luno filmed an Ivory Bill Woodpecker in Arkansas. Same guy. And um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service designated it as a real video. But the official narrative is, that's not an Ivory Bill. The feds even said it was. Right? They never do. Right? And the scientific community, it could not be. There's no way. That is ridiculous. There's been another one. Why? It shook up the narrative. Scientists make their money off grants. Can't blame them. If you rock the boat too much, you might not get the grant, you don't get paid. That's the way that works. Okay? The media just wants to spin something to the next viral story. They don't care if they can ridicule you or put whatever. But they tend to go along and toe the line. And a lot of other people are just worried about getting kicked out of the Facebook group for saying something that doesn't work, right? <laughs> but what it creates for wildlife is kind of an underground where it doesn't get noticed. If it doesn't fit this, no this, this certain thing, it's not real. If it could happen over a bird, we know for a fact existed with specimens and photos what would a possible hominid or unknown primate do? What kind of shake-up would that be to the community? If it happens to a bird, and that's been one of the things, I've seen the same thing with cougars existence in East Texas. No cougars in East Texas. Why wouldn't there be? See, I go back, I collect, by the way, if you ever want to donate something to me besides money, okay? <laughs> Old wildlife books, I collect them. And if you go back before the Endangered Species Act in 1973, the wildlife range and distribution is radically different. You'll see, before people were worried about logging getting shut down and stuff like that, and you'll see all kinds of different ranges for animals. The cougar is, is indigenous to the whole lower 48, okay? Most of Canada, up into parts of Alaska, all the way down to Argentina. Why wouldn't they be in East Texas? There's no reason. I've actually saw an official study that they only live west of I-35 in Texas. <laughs> so I'm thinking about cougars, which can have a home range of 125 miles, you know? And you think about that, that is a, that's a pretty big home range for an animal, right? Thinking about the cougar, and he looks across I-35 and goes, there's more woods over there. It's wetter. There's just as many deer. But we're gonna like hang out over here, right? <laughs> Does it make sense, you know? These are some just basic observations I've got on investigating stories like cougars and stuff over the years. How to translate to Bigfoot is the fact that the narrative is shaken up. Somebody's position is threatened. There's an underground for this stuff, right? And the underground is people like us that go look for it. And want to go study and say, you know, you see that, hear that in the woods, but I heard something else. You said that was that crossing the road, but it didn't match any of that, but you said that's the best ex explanation you can give. Now I'll give you a great example of this. So I go to a writer's event, an outdoor writer's event in Texas, and I haven't hardly had any negative feedback from my professional community on what I do in the wildlife world, but I had one guy in an event. This is before I was back walking with Christ, okay? So let me, let, I'll preface that with my response to him. I'm walking through the hotel, and this guy, I met a couple of times, and he had, he had a beer in his hand, sloshing it around, kind of, and he's like, hey man, I think we found some Bigfoot tracks out behind the hotel. <clears throat> I gave him some sign language you could probably understand, literally, and walked off. And this guy's following me like a stall, and he's freaked out. Oh man, I didn't mean to video you, blah, 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 so don't act like an idiot, okay? And I'm like, getting in the elevator, he gets in the elevator with him. <laughs> and I'm going, I can't believe this guy, he goes, I never saw a Bigfoot. I said, well, okay. I really don't care. You know, he's like, but I did see something weird. <laughs> okay, what did you see? And I'm like, this is amazing. This goes into something I look for as a journalist. He goes, I was driving in Newton County, Texas. Whoa, buddy, you got my attention now. That's the county north of me where I've done the bulk of my research. 
And he goes, I was by Old Salem. It said Old Salem, and there was a sign that said Nichols Creek. And I'm like, my God, that's where I've had two reports in the last five years, right by the Nichols Creek sign. And he goes, I saw this thing standing on the side of the road. They were coming hunting from Dallas, and it was like 5 o'clock in the morning. They were running late to get to the deer lease. And he said it was walking, it was right by the white line on the road, about to step on the road. And he's on the passenger side. And he said there's this six to six and a half foot tall gray thing that had longish gray hair and a face that looked kind of like a man, kind of like an ape, standing on the side of the road. He literally looked out, and it's like, um, it looked out, it's like right here. It's li he's looking at its face. And, I, and I'm going, well, the interesting part for me, I didn't tell him this, was that I had two reports of Great Bigfoot crossing that road in five years. He had no idea about it, never been published. So I had a pattern for him, right? And I said, well, Mr. Expert, Mr. Skeptic, I would, you think Bigfoot's did what did you see? And he goes, I thought it was some kind of weird wolf or something. I said, let me get this right. I'm weird because I think Bigfoot might be real, but you're seeing bipedal werewolves? No offense, Ken. You're into that stuff. Bigfoot may be the werewolf, but this guy's thinking I'm crazy. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, that's the kind of stuff you might encounter. Anybody ever encounter anything goofy like that where people just think you're nuts and whatever? Well, this is an interesting um, opportunity to be in front of you, and I just want to share a few nuggets from my investigations. It kind of maybe give you the idea that the narrative is the best thing that hides Bigfoot. I don't even think Bigfoot hides itself that well compared to a lot of things. I think it's the narrative that we don't want to look at things. We don't want to accept things that rocks the boat. And for a long time, I thought, well, they're probably going to be recognized as a species. Probably, I think they may never be recognized in the species. Maybe they will. Maybe they'll be recognized in a certain circle, but never designated like, you know, this is Sasquatch, you know. But the, don't, don't let that rob you of your joy of doing this. Because that's really the key. I look back on these incredible experiences I've had with rocks thrown at me and vocalization that sounded like King Kong rampaging Skull Island and all this cool stuff that... The little boy grew up in Orange, Texas in the late 70s, early 80s. Dream come true stuff, right? Walking on the, with, with Smokey Crabtree on the, on the Boggy Creek one day. Right? That was so cool for me. Showing me a spot they filmed the, 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 the kayak, the Piro scene. And um, i got to share this real quick. He says, he's putting a gun, a huge gun on. 357, he goes, Chester, the same for the monster. It's for the people out here. <laughs> I just hear it. God, I love Smokey. He was a great guy. But don't let all the division. He says United this year. If, if this guy believes it's okay to take one out to make a specimen and prove them, or this guy doesn't, or this guy thinks they're supernatural, or this guy thinks they're flesh and blood, don't let it rob your joy of all this. Folks, we're hunting monsters. All right? We're, we're, we're in the unknown. It's exciting. And don't, my, my greatest memories are my father who died three years ago was way more into Bigfoot than I ever was. And um, that, my, my time with him in the field, that, that night with the vocalization that proved it to me, he was there with me. And he looked over at me and said, it sounds like the Falk monster or something. And I'll never forget that. Don't forget your time with your family. Let, let this be a joyful experience and take kids with you. My wife and I have a ministry. Our, our, our mission is to bring the redeeming love of Christ to hurting children who have terminal illness, have been sexually abused, physically abused, and neglected in the foster system with our Kingdom Zoo Wildlife Center. And uh, we do a program where we grant exotic animal encounters where kids have a terminal illness or have lost a parent or a sibling. And we did a Sasquatch wish. It was our third wish. Cool. All right? And I know God was in this because it, uh, nothing was happening that night. And we stayed out in the thicket. And we... And the kids were pumped because they found mountain lion tracks, the cougar tracks, and we're looking around. And I promised them, because it was it was like a sunny night and um, school night. So I said, we got, we'll got stop three times on the way out and call out. I forgot. I was so tired. I forgot the third one. Dad said, stop. He said, promise them three times. I literally put on the brakes, go out, let out a whoop, long, long, given type call, and one call back like he was sitting in the bushes right there. 
and that little boy's day was made. So that's the kind of stuff you can do with Bigfoot. Don't ever let yourself be robbed of being a kid at heart, because this is fun stuff. God bless you guys, and thank you for having me.